I'm Jessica Gonzalez. And I'm Sarah Bloomquist, and this is the True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. I'm Matt O'Donnell, and this True Philadelphia Podcast episode is a deep dive into our latest 6ABC true crime episode, The Disappearance of Daniel Imbo and Richard Patrone. The video story has only been live on YouTube for a few days and has already generated a whole lot of attention. Now, you've probably heard about this baffling missing persons case, a local couple that's been dating for a while, both with small children, steps out of a bar on South Street and is never seen again. No trace whatsoever. The case recently reached its 15th anniversary, and our true crime team of anchors Sarah Bloomquist and producer Jessica Gonzalez spent an enormous amount of time taking a brand new look at this unsolved case. In this podcast episode, they go beyond their YouTube long-form piece as Sarah and Jess offer new perspectives, information, and avenues on this haunting story, including what path the FBI may be on right now. 6 ABC's True Crime Deep Dive, right now on the True Philadelphia Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt O'Donnell here with Jessica Gonzalez and Sarah Bloomquist, the producer and reporter of the latest 6 ABC True Crime series episode, which is called The Disappearance of Imbo and Patron. Thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. We're going to try and get into... Uh, at a deeper level, you know, the piece, which is very lengthy and very good, very impressive, well done. Uh, talk about, you know, some of the background between these two people. But first of all, obviously we have these two people who have been missing for 15 years. The anniversary came up. Beyond the fact that we're hitting, you know, a number divisible by five, why the interest in this and why do this now? Well, we've launched this true crime series recently, and it's really a chance for us to go back and look at cases throughout the years. And we knew that the anniversary of this one was coming up on February, in February 19th. So we wanted to really push to get it on the air by February 19th. And we've been working over the last month or so to put it all together. And you've done a lot of reporting on this case over the years. And Jess, just curious about your perspective, because you arrived here at the station after the disappearance right. happened. What was your initial impression when you heard about the story? Um, so before we launched this whole series, we kind of did an informal poll of the cases that stood out to Philadelphians. And one that continuously came up was Imbo and Patron. And it was just such a a strange mystery, you know, a 3,000-pound truck, a couple walks out of a bar on what is now, I mean, it's usually a very populated street, but, I mean, vanished into thin air. It was just something that everybody could kind of picture themselves in, so it's As fascinating. context, Jim Gardner told me yesterday it is the most interesting, fascinating case he thinks in his entire career here at Action News. That's saying a lot. That is saying a lot. Yeah, you say, in, you, you just say Imbo Patron here in the city of Philadelphia, and people know what you're talking about. It's become these, this, these two names that are forever linked and just are forever in the memory of, of this city. The other reason, obviously, is FBI is trying to solve this case. You talk to the FBI investigator who has been on this case all along. Let's first, though, set the scene, not instead of t starting from the beginning. Let's start from that night. February 19, 2005, we have Daniel Imbo and Richard Patron. What was happening that night? Where did they go? What did they do? So um, at the time that this was happening, Daniel Imbo was going through a, a difficult divorce from her husband, Joe Imbo. And just to set this up, they had planned, they, sh they had an 18-month-old son, Joe Jr., and he was with his father that night, and there were plans the next day for him to bring little Joe back to Danielle's house. So that night, Danielle didn't have the baby, so she made plans to go out. We hadn't known this prior. We all knew about Abilene's and what had happened on South Street, but they had made plans to go out with, um, it, so Danielle, Richard Imbo's sister, Christine Girardi, and their mothers, um, Marge Patron and Felice Otobre. So they started the night at Chickie's and Pete's. We should also set up, there's a lot of backstory here. Um, Danielle Imbo, 
grew up in the same neighborhood with the Patron family, and Richard Patron's sister, Christine, was her best friend mm -hmm. growing up. So they begin the night at Chickies and Pete's, and Richard and Danielle had been seeing each other. They had sort of dated in high school mm -hmm. a little bit, and they had rekindled that romance. So they're at Chickies and Pete's, and Richard keeps calling Danielle, come meet me, come meet me. You want to pick it up there? Yeah, right. sure. So they want to meet at Abilene's. Actually, they, uh, Richard was at the tap room, and right. he wanted Danielle and Christine and not the mothers, but th he wanted them to come out with him. And so the last time Christine saw Danielle, she dropped her off at the tap room to meet uh, Richard, and then she went back to Jersey because she had work the next day. From there, uh, apparently... Richard and Danielle were both calling Christine, trying to get her to go to Abilene's to watch a band perform, meet some friends. She said, I have to work in the morning, so have fun. And that was, once again, that was the last time she talked to either of them. So then they went to Abilene's, uh, they had a few drinks, they met some friends, they walked out of the bar, and we mentioned in the story that Richard was really pleased with himself for finding this great parking spot, which was, we, nobody actually knows where it is, but he thought that it was close somewhere to the bar on South Street. It was a very, very cold night, like in the 20s, um, like 27 degrees or something. So he was really, he told people at the bar, I got this great parking spot, mm -hmm. but nobody knows where it is. So they, they walked out, and that is the last anybody ever saw of them. They just mm -hmm. vanished into thin air. There's never been a witness who's come forward who says, I saw them getting in the car or saw anything unusual. So this is 11.30 when they leave the bar, 11.30 p.m. <laughs> and really the last time anyone sees them is before they actually get outside, but they're leaving the bar, right? They're leaving the bar. I, the group that they were with, I believe, was going to go to a different bar down the street. But they both had um, made plans. Remember, Danielle had to hook up with her son and her estranged husband the next day. She also had a haircut scheduled for the morning with Christine, coincidentally, who, who does hair. So they said, no, we need, we need to get going. Richard, by the way, we should say, um, was raising his then 14-year-old daughter, Angela. And he also was working at Viking Pastries, Pastries here in Ardmore, which is a well-known bakery that people knew. But he also, the next day, he was a huge NASCAR fan, and he was going to go watch the NASCAR races. So they had a lot of things planned for the next day. Right. So they, that was the end of the night. They were, they, were, they were finished. They headed to the car, and that was the last anybody ever saw of them. And with this truck that they were going to get back into, Jess, this was a large truck. Right. It was a 3,000-pound <clears throat> 3, 2001 Dodge Dakota. And it, was, it had a NASCAR sticker on the back. It was not something that you could you know, drive into a garage and have it disappear. It, I mean, you could, but it, it's not likely. I mean, Vito mentioned over and over that in order to maybe two people go missing, but a, two people and a truck, it's really unlikely that it was random. It, you know, somebody and knew what they were doing. Make that happen likely would have taken more than one person. Sure. So speaking of which, the FBI uh, agent Vito Roselli, who was the original person on this case, said to you guys that he's confident it was a murder, that there was foul play, and that people know. And when I hear him say people know, obviously that's an intriguing statement. It sounds like there are people who were not involved with this might know some details and haven't come forward. were involved with it, but it, it, the family believes that strongly too. And we asked him that, I asked him that very directly a few times. Are you saying it's not just a person who knows, but people know? And he said, people know. There's People can tell them. Um, and I think in the, the, one of the biggest things of all of this is that the, they just want to have the family know. It may not even be a case that is ever able to be prosecuted, but I think they want to be able, law enforcement wants people to tell this family. I mean, it's just been brutal for them, unbearable, these 15 years to the not knowing. Yeah, Jess, I remember the uh, brother of Daniel Imbo saying, I'm scared to know what happened. Right. That was That was something that really stood out to us. He said he, even if he finds out what happens it's it's not a good place for him to go to because he doesn't like to picture the last moments of Danielle's life he They're, they know it must be horrific right it would have been horrific and they likely knew in that moment that this was the, the end last, right when do you think investigators decided listen they're not out there anymore um I think the fact that they uh, their cell phones were never answered there was never a credit card used 
no, I mean, the, these were, we emphasize in this story as well, these were two people who were very attached and uh, adored their children, and they just would have never right. left. This was so out of character that I think as the t as time went by, they they knew they were not. So, so maybe back. in a matter of weeks or months or like. I mean, Angela and Christine, Christine notably, this was one soundbite that stood mm -hmm. out to a lot of our viewers. She said, by that night, I knew I would never see them again. She, Christine, who's Richard's sister, and Danielle were both going through a divorce at the same time. They were also best friends. They spent long hours talking. And I think in those conversations, maybe things had come up that made her con okay. concerned. So there are a lot of players here, a lot of names. Um, but let, let's go back to some of the period before you know this all happened that night on February 19th, 2005. So Richard Bertrone would be up around 50 years old this year. Uh, Daniel Limbo would be about 49. So they're both about the, the same age. Daniel Limbo, uh, has sort of a notoriety when it comes to her father. Talk about that. Well, during the course of the interview with her brother, John, he mentioned, he, he was talking about her, and he got very excited when he talked about her singing ability. And he said she took after our father, who was a, a local celebrity in South Philadelphia. He, Otobre, John Otobre, went by Johnny October, and he was part of a doo-wop band called The Four Dates, and they performed with Frankie Avalon, and Jess actually found video of mm -hmm. them performing. And I think what was striking to us is that the families gave us all these photos that had never been published before. And when we did a side-by-side -side with Danielle's father, Johnny October, and her, the resemblance is striking. And our editor, Leanne Gaudi, um, she actually did a transition where she mer she put their faces side by side and then kind of merged them into one and it was uncanny. Mm. Yeah, they just had great musical ability. So Imbo and Patron, like you mentioned, they knew each other almost all their lives. They kind of grew up together, but nothing really sort of happened beyond them being friends back then. Correct. Um, so Danielle was actually married at 21 and that relationship didn't work out. So she moved to New York for a few years, came back, got married to Joe, I think they were married for what about a year and a half or two years. The, well, they I think they were married in 2002, okay. and the, they were still going through divorce proceedings in 2005 right. when the disappearance Which happened. The divorce was made final at at some point after their disappearance. I would imagine. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they reconnected while they were both going through their separation. I I mean, Christine Richard's sister referenced that she she would come around all the time and. Once he came around, they realized they had very they had a lot of similarities. They were both single parents at the time, and they never really lost that connection. Mm -hmm. Richard never married his daughter's mother, mm -hmm. but they right. she, he he was raising her and. And I remember Richard Patron saying that his first true love was Daniel Limbo. They they definitely he really was he liked her a lot and um, the family his family Richard Patron's family says that repeatedly that he he hadn't dated very seriously I mean I think he was very committed to raising his daughter but now here she is she's fourteen hey, this is an old family friend he felt very comfortable with um, with Danielle and, and his daughter Angela says it was a, really the first serious relationship she can remember him having the first time. Here he's bringing her to family parties and things like things like that. And they also both really liked music, okay. and they they bonded over that. It's, it seems like there wasn't so much of a romantic interest between the two, but more so they were leading very similar lives. They're single parents, uh, trying to find someone that they can connect with and live with, and they hadn't been able to do that up until then. Right. I mean, I definitely there there was a love shared between them. I think that they were they were a romantic couple. Okay. But, I mean, they had a shared history, um, so it was also just, it kind of felt like home, and it was a source of comfort for one another. So everything seemed to be going just fine up until that night, didn't it? Yeah, and what really struck me when I was talking to them, and I, which I had not realized, again, we all thought this story began, started and ended at Abilene's, but talking to them and realizing that, wait, no, they, they started at Chickie's and Pete's, and then there was this, uh, you know, this phone call, and Richard wanted to meet her at the um, tap room in South Philly, and it was very spur of the moment. 
So there was it was a random night. They went. They were here. They were there. There was nothing planned ahead of time. So, um, you know, when you when Vito says he thinks this was a murder, he thinks it was foul play. If you start thinking about well, were they followed or did right. somebody know? It, it, that would have been very difficult. I mean, it was that kind of a night. Before they vanished, there was nothing that the family knew or saw or suspected was wrong. Absolutely not. I mean, they both of them talked at length. They were very family-oriented. They had no criminal past. They had no ties to anything shady. Um, Vito kept describing Rich as a knock-around guy, a hard worker. Um, just there was absolutely nothing that would make them targets. And people kept referencing just some of the viewer feedback, coming up with theories and said, well, maybe they're in the witness protection program. Maybe they were tied to something. And Angela and Johnny both said they would never, they would never leave their children. If that was something, you know, completely far-fetched con um, concept, like they would have taken their kids with them. They wouldn't have disappeared without the, their children. The FBI wouldn't be actively investigating right, this there case, be too. Right, billboards up if they were in the witness protection program, sure. so. Yeah. All right, well, I want to go into what the uh, FBI and police have been doing since the disappearance, but you were able to go into what used to be Abilene's, the restaurant that they were last seen on South Street, which is not Abilene's anymore, and you were able to take some video. Now, who took that, and, and what is the restaurant right now? Um, so right now it's just a vacant space, and that was just, that was a kind of an action news stroke of luck. We were going to shoot a stand-up uh, where Sarah was going to kind of recreate them walking out of the bar, and we didn't think we were going to get into the bar, walking down the street and vanishing. But as we pulled up, there was a, a guy locking up, and Sarah, as I was getting the gear out of the out of the car, she kind of ran up and said, oh, do you, do you have any ties to this? And he said, yeah, I'm the owner of this building. We said, oh, great, can we come in and look around? And he let us in, and it was just, it was an eerie feeling. There's nothing in there, but it still looked like a bar. It still had the... It's had several iterations yeah, since... It a uh, yeah, it was a Thai restaurant. It was a Thai, Thai restaurant the last time. Yeah, the last time they've... They, it, Abilene's used to be a multi-level place where bands would perform on different levels. Now the upstairs are apartments, so... Um, Both of you were inside? Mm -hmm. what and you, What kind of feeling did you get, sir? It just... It was just dark. I mean, it was... And I spent most of my time... Jess was shooting the video, but I talked to the, the owner, and he was telling me... He owned the building when the disappearance happened, and he told us for a very long time he stayed away from the building. And he, he said the employees never knew, didn't even, I don't think, remembered them being in there, Danielle and Richard, but he just felt, like, kind of creeped out about this, even this building that he owned and the association with this disappearance. I'm sure when both of you left the bar, went through the door, there was a significant moment for both of you. Right. I mean, it, it is just because you look across the street, there are like dozens of stores. And even at one o'clock in the afternoon, South Street was very, very well populated. There were, you know, people stopping as I was shooting video and saying, oh, I know what they're doing. I bet they're they're talking about Danielle and Richard or that's where the couple disappeared. It's just such an unlikely story because especially it was Saturday night, you know, they, it would have been packed and it could have been I any. South Street was even way more popular in 2005. Right than it is today. It's kind of going through a, a phase right now. Sure, but sure. Um, oh, I had a thought. Uh, I think, too, when, when you're standing there and you're looking around, I, I keep thinking in my mind, where did they park? Right. Where did they park? Which way did they even go? Yeah. Is, is and Vito says, I have, an, I have an idea. I have a thought of where they probably parked. But he didn't really right. disclose It had to have been that. along South Street somewhere, you would you think, You would right? think. Right. I mean, unless it, there was a lot or something nearby. But he again, he kept bragging. Uh -huh. Right, which is the, an interesting fact that everybody oh, remembers. Is I, I recalled my thought. <laughs> that in 2005, I mean, we keep having these conversations that this could never have happened today. There are cameras everywhere. Sure. 2005. There weren't. Right. Uh, there were not along South Street. And not only that, the phone records, the, the, the cell phones weren't pinging off towers. They didn't, the phone companies didn't keep records. 
So today, that mm -hmm. all those would have all been clues as to what happened to and them. GPS they, on the phones. Yeah. They would have been tracked within an inch of their life. It would have been an almost immediate. You could tell where a person went. But yeah. That's a great point. So let's talk about after their disappearance. And there is one, what we know now as an insignificant moment, but in one year, the next year, 2006, they find a truck in the Delaware River. Yeah, so this truck gets found, and the, it's this moment of hope, I think, for the family. And uh, Danielle's brother, John, described to me, I said, did you go there? And he said, no, but I had a friend who was a Camden police officer who was on the scene. And he called him and said, John, it's not the car. He said, this is a Dodge Ram. Right. It wasn't even the same make. It wasn't the same make. He said, I'm standing here with the owner. It's not the car. But... Um, he said he was grateful that he had a friend there because he didn't want to see it. He got ahead of it, and it wasn't on the news yet. Um, so he knew ahead of even the news media that it was not sure. the car. And one thing that stuck out to me that we didn't get into the podcast is when you asked Christine when they found the truck, did you have hope then? And she said, mm-mm. Yeah. He said... It's almost like she had a premonition. Yeah. She, she said the night... So the next day after they weren't... Nobody could get a hold of them... Um, Calls were going to their cell phones. Danielle, or Christine said by that night she just knew they were never going to see them again. She just knew. All right, so along the, the many years that, that take place and go by, people start to come up with stories, and we've talked about a few of them. But you mentioned in the piece motorcycle gangs, uh, prison confessions, and involvement in bad things, which you talked about as well. Were there other rumors swirling around that were just coming out of left field? Yeah, there were a lot. There was a guy arrested in Bucks County for a um, a pill ring that was operating in, like I think, Kensington. Was Rod Carey? Robert, Robert Carey, Robert yeah. Carey, yeah. It was Operation Fishtown. And he, the very next day, hanged himself in his jail cell. And there was always this rumor, especially in like the Port Richmond neighborhood in Kensington, that he had done it and he had left a suicide note that mentioned Imbo and Patron. And I asked Vito Roselli, was there a note? And he said, there was a note. And I said, did it mention Imbo and Patron? He said, it did not. That has always been a rumor. I don't know where that started, but that has always been a but rumor. But they clearly looked at this individual. They did. Yeah, they did. And, but it, then he died, and that made that you know, more difficult to look, to pursue. Joe Imbo. What do we know? He's, he's still alive. He's not living in this area. What, what do we know about his contact with investigators, what he's doing, uh, their son? Uh, so he had, Vito mentioned, he had a very solid alibi. He was in Tom's River that night with uh, a number of family members, a number of friends, some in law enforcement. So he was, he was questioned multiple times. He took a polygraph. He passed the polygraph. I, I don't think they said if he passed, they, they've never, I don't think they've disclosed whether. Oh, I thought that was indicated. No, I don't think he, they, because I said he took a polygraph, but I don't think they've ever said one way mm. or or the other. The facts remain, this was not an amicable separation in terms of the fact that Daniel Limbo was very upset about it, chain smoking, yeah. uh, stressed out, right? Yeah, and I think Vito mentions that they, this, they'd come to the time in their, their talk, their, divorce proceedings where they were talking about money and it was it was difficult I, I we do we should say at this point that Joe Imbo has said publicly repeatedly that he had nothing to do right. with his with Danielle's disappearance and we just did reach him on Facebook right. what do you say um, he said that he was happy that we were keeping the story in the media and remembering Danielle but he had nothing more to add about the story at this time he does, the son, little Joe, lives with him in the south, like South Carolina or Georgia. South Carolina, I believe. So, and, um, Which is understandable because it would be hard for anyone to have to still live around here and to have been going he through moved, the separation. He moved pretty soon, right. I think, afterward. Um, little Joe is still very much a part of Danielle's uh, brother's family. Sure. He comes up and visits. They go to the shore. He's apparently... Very musically inclined, like his no surprise, right? like his mother. His 12 yeah, instruments. twelve instruments, and, um, and the, they talk. Um, 
John has two twin boys, and they talk on the, I don't really know how you do this, but you talk on Xbox, I guess. Yes, I've seen it happen. (laughs) They they talk on Xbox every day, so they're always in touch with little Joe. He's, I mean, that's what they have left. He says, I see, I see little Joe, I mean, they see Danielle and little Joe smile in his musical ability. It's difficult, but that's something that they'll always, always have. Tell me about Anthony Rodeski. So, Anthony Rodeski, Danielle and Richard Patron disappear in February 2005. In March 2005, Anthony Rodeski murdered a guy in his home. And this is in Philadelphia, right? This was in South Jersey. Okay. In South Jersey. He murdered a guy in his home. Then in March of two th- in April of 2005, he murdered a motel owner in South Jersey. Um, he's a bad guy. He's now in um, a supermax prison in Illinois. Um, they looked at him. They searched his home. Um, and I don't think he's been ruled out, is my sense from the FBI. Right. And that, that's an interesting point to make. No one's been ruled out. No. no Including, one. I don't want to pick on him, but Joe Imbo. Like, no one has been ruled out. Right. Vito specifically said um, one of the sound bites we used at the very top of the, pod, or very top of the documentary was, uh, I can't rule him out as a suspect, and he was referring to Joe Imbo. Um, there, it's really it's a it's a very frustrating and intriguing. I, I mean, Vito referred to this as his white whale. This is the case that it's like yeah, Moby Dick, right? Right. He can't let to it go. It. He can't let it go. Right. We really got the sense through all of this that, and we have this driving what we call a stand up. This shot where Jess and I are driving along. There's really this sense in the interview that. The FBI was saying, we, we have direction. We just need almost y- us, y- the two of us, to help get the message out and prompt somebody to come forward. And, they was, and Vito was very specific that he believes this case will be solved by someone who's sitting in jail right now. Yes, he did say that. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's somebody sitting in jail <laughs> right now in Supermax who is interested in, uh, you know, some some type of deal. He's expressed interest. He's appealed his sentence over and over again. Um, he's trying to get transferred. Is this so, Rodeski? Yeah. Correct. So, I mean, but we don't know for sure if it's him. It could be, could be somebody else. And, um, you know, that around that time in 2005, there was a big car theft ring. I think there were 13,000 cars stolen about that time. Vito does mention there was a, a car shredder down in South Jersey, you, if you headed South, South, Philly. South Philly, right. If you, if you think if you're headed down toward the airport and you're going to make the right onto the Platte Bridge, it was right, was right there on the corner. It's now been leveled, and it's going to be a super Wawa. But that is a place where you could have taken a large yes. truck, perhaps with two bodies in it, yes. and gotten, not gotten rid of it, but made I mean, it not, all, it wouldn't be a truck anymore. Speculation, but the, that has been a strong theory of law enforcement. Um, one <clears throat> local law enforcement person told me you could pull in there, they'd hand you $500, no questions asked, and that was right. it. But we don't know. We don't know. And there, again, that's a, that's a theory, that's speculation at this point, but in our interview with the FBI, he did bring it up. And he said multiple times, there was, there's a car crusher and there's a car shredder. And at first we were thinking that kind of came out of left field, but then as, as we kind of analyze the case, and it, it would be a, a theory that would make sense as to where this truck would go. They searched the water, people thought maybe they drove off, you know, they were drinking and driving and drove off the road and- Which has happened. They've, I mean, there's yes. so many cars right. in the Delaware River right now. Right. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, in the day, the days after, for a long, long time, Denise's brother, I mean, Danielle's brother, John, just drove around looking and looking and looking and looking and... Along with Richard Sr. Along with Richard Sr., yeah. Um, and he has this soundbite where he says, um, if you ever have that feeling, and everybody has it at least one time in their life, where you feel like something isn't quite right. He said he has that feeling every day, from the moment he wakes up till the moment he goes to sleep. That could, that's just unimaginable to me. That's, that's something that really struck me when I was watching the piece as well. And you kind of forget because you're trying to gather facts yeah. and you're speculating. But in the end, 
there are multiple people who get this feeling this is, every moment of the day. Yeah, this is th just doing this interview was torture for him. I mean, it was really, really difficult. He swore, uh, I may think maybe at the 10th anniversary, he was never doing this again. It's just too, too hard. And in fact, when he came, it walked in, he came with his wife and, and sat down. And you know, in the moment when they're getting the cameras ready and you're just sure. talking to somebody. And I said, wow, John, can you, can you believe we're, it's 15 years? And he just completely broke down just totally broke down. And it feels he, like yesterday to him, doesn't he it? He said, um, you're the first person to say it. And he said, it, it just, and I said, does it feel like it's been 15 years? Does it feel like it's been five minutes? And he said, both, both. As reporters, you, you don't want to speculate. You're doing a job, you work on facts, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway. It, and go into a, an area that you're comfortable with, obviously, Anything to add to say, you know, do you think you know what happened? I mean, I'm putting you on the spot. Right, too, right. I, I think that we laid out some of the theories the FBI has um, in, the, in the documentary. I, I mean, he, he has <laughs> said there are, he has two paths, two mm -hmm. possible motives, and he just wants someone to tell him which one is right. Um, what are they? <laughs> I can't, I don't want to say. Okay. Right. Well, let me ask this. Could this be a case of mistaken identity? It could be. He said, um, we asked too, if, could this just be random? Could, and, um, or was somebody just sent to, to beat him up or something and it went horribly wrong, you know, went way beyond that. I mean, there's, they just don't know. Right. It's so, with so few facts and, uh, so little evidence, although he does say we have a lot of information. And he told me we, they have boxes and boxes mm -hmm. of things, but didn't disclose what, the, the, what those were. I think they just want somebody to say, to piece it together and say, right. this is the right theory. How do you read the FBI agent and how he's dealing with this? I know they're very stoic, but um, this must be driving him mad. Right. I mean, this was, Sarah mentioned, this was such an unusual interview because usually the FBI, they're very, they're very reserved. They're very conscientious of what they say and what they don't say. And there is a PR person sitting in there. And normally they'll, they'll interrupt and say, uh, next question, or we don't answer that or something. And she was saying there was not a single question that was off limits. They talked openly, honestly, they never said, you know, take that out. It was just, it shows the motivation to solve this case. It's something that haunts authorities. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you've interviewed some, like, federal law enforcement sure. officials, and they're often not, they're boring sometimes. It's just, <laughs> you know, we can't say, I'm sorry, I can't answer that, no we're not talking about that right now. This was not that. This was a least an hour-long interview, and Jess is right, he answered every single question. One more thing, it's been out for a couple of days, the YouTube piece, uh, the true crime piece. Tell me how the FBI has reacted to it so far and tell me how the families have reacted to it so far. Um, so yesterday we got an email from our FBI contact and she said, thank you so much for doing this and keeping the case alive and the families were, it was very well received by the families. I mean, it's just unimaginable. Angela, who was 14 at the time, is now 30 and she has a child of her own and watching him grow up she sees you know bits of her father in him and she kept saying he would have just loved him he would have loved him so it's a case that we we really hope that this will i mean whether it's youtube in jail in prison somebody i mean it has i think the last time i checked ten thousand views so, so far people are sharing this people are reacting to it there's it's a south philly legend yeah, it was the number one story on our website like, immediately. And um, I think our goal was to do right by these families, first and fo foremost. And I mean, we'd love to hear them, hear that they've had some resolution. I mean, I, maybe I said this earlier, but we may never know. We probably, I think that's likely we won't know, but there may come a day when the family knows what happened and maybe it, it, are you talking about a situation where they're going to tell them listen this is what we think happened we're just never going to be able to bring this to a yes. prosecution yes i i think that that's i asked that 
Is there a possibility that you find out what happened, but you don't have enough to prosecute anybody? And they said, yes. And I said, well, then when we find out, would you tell us? And they said, no, probably not. Probably no. not. One more thing, and you touched on this, Jess. The day that they disappeared, there weren't cameras everywhere. Everyone didn't have an iPhone with an ability to take a picture. Right. Technology was so far, uh, it, it was like primitive right. <laughs> compared to what it is now. And now everyone, people in prison, in fact, can watch things on the internet, YouTube, mm -hmm. there's Twitter, there's I Facebook. The this, is, this is going all over the place. So it's almost like maybe time is on their side because things have changed. Right. right. And I mean, in today's world, Reddit forums are dedicated to, you know, internet sleuths, social media sleuths. They will take even, I, I mean, I was looking at some of the Facebook comments last night. Within 30 minutes, people were breaking down every single word. Oh, well, the sister said this. And do you think that, you know, why did the FBI agent say this? And I mean, it could just be a little, like a little nugget buried in the story that triggers a memory for somebody and they can, they can reach out. And there's so many ways now you can submit a tip through email. Uh, there's phone call. You can tweet the FBI. I mean, it's a different, it's a completely different world. Yeah. Someone who knows something could be watching, listening to this and right. watching your piece right now. Yeah. And, and Vito said this, uh, this is going to be somebody sitting in jail who would like a deal, and they should know this case is still very much in the interest of the FBI. Well done. Great piece, well-researched, very intriguing, and let's hope something happens. And we'll be back for the next true crime. Sure. Yeah. By the way, what's it going to be? Uh, so our next case is about the Bucks County boys, uh, Cosmo, Donardo Farm. That's with Annie McCormick. And then we have a whole list of stories that we're intrigued by. We also, I mean, if there are stories out there that people would like covered, we can, they can certainly submit them you know, through our Facebook page. Sounds like time is not on your side with that. There's not enough hours in the day to, the city to get all The city of Philadelphia has no shortage of, of high-profile crimes and, yeah, people who've done really bad things that um, are interesting to go back and review. Some solved, some unsolved. Sarah Bloomquist, Jessica Gonzalez, True Crime on the True Philadelphia Podcast. It's a pleasure talking to you both. Thanks for having us, Matt. Thanks to Sarah and Jess for a fascinating deep dive into the disappearance of Imbo and Patron, which you can watch right now on the 6ABC Philadelphia YouTube page. And look for more true crime episodes soon. I'm Matt O'Donnell. I'm honored you've spent some time to listen to the True Philadelphia podcast. We have plenty more and plenty on the way. Stay true. Stay true.